just to preface things by a little bit, Menno is very sorry he couldn't make it. He kindly recorded his teachings in English in Jerusalem and sent them. The quality appears to be pretty good. We also have a plan B of some of his videos should it be necessary, but we're hoping that what was transmitted is going to work. Um, that should be okay. He's just stuck in, everybody I've talked to in Israel is giving me the same story. Secondly, Moriel has fundamentals, but it also has things most of us believe, but we don't consider to be fundamental. Most of you know that I and most people in Moriel believe that the rapture occurs between the sixth and seventh seals. We do not believe that the Lord will return before the faithful church knows who the Antichrist is. We have this view. My particular view is called intraseal. It's very similar to something called pre-wrath. Be that as it may, half of my Christian friends are pre-trib. Half. Half of them. Uh, people I like and respect. It's ministries I otherwise endorse. Um, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, Menno, a number of people. They take a pre-tribulational position. I do not. We disagree on that point. Now, my problem, of course, is with those who deny there is a rapture. I accept the fact that people who believe in the rapture will place it at different points. Uh, for me, this is a very important issue. But it's an important issue for discussion, prayerful discussion, careful discussion. It is not a matter for division. Unfortunately, there are some people in the pre-trib camp, by no means all of them, who've made it a fundamental, who've gone to the extreme of saying that people who are not pre-trib are of the devil and things like this. There's actually people saying this. Um, because more people are leaving the pre-trib position, they're getting very militant in their defense of it. Again, it's a very important issue. It needs to be addressed. Every believer needs to prayerfully and carefully consider the issue itself. But our problem is with those who deny there is a rapture. We're not going to fight with those who believe there is one, but who may place it at a different point than we do, as convinced as we are that they are mistaken on that point. Menno is in a situation in Israel right now that you may have seen addressed on the Moriel website or on Moriel TV, the video by Pastor Michael Nisim in Galilee on the rise of the new apostolic reformation inside Israel. Uh, this has become a serious issue. Uh, it's a problem. It's dividing a certain section of the body of Christ. And a lot of biblically ignorant people are going with this messianic version of NAR. Of, now, the NAR is a combination of Gnosticism, mysticism, and restorationism. You know what went on in Britain in the 80s with uh, the Kingdom Now theology and the Dominionism and Roger Foster and Gerald Coates and Terry Virgo and all that stuff and Bryn Jones. The, the, it's that, only it's not replacement theology. Those guys were replacementists. This is a non-replacement, this version of it, but has the same ideas. These ideas essentially are not new. They are known as not premillennial, I'm sorry, not pre-trib, but post-trib. Um, post-trib, that Satan has already bound or the church has authority to bind him. And as I always ask, if Satan's bound, please tell me who keeps letting him go. Nonetheless, <clears throat> This has come to Israel big time. Because God is working in Israel, because of the prophetic importance of Israel and God's plan for the return of Christ, <clears throat> because Jews and, and Arabs are being saved in numbers that have become comparatively significant compared to what they used to be. Um, again, you've got fellowships of soldiers in the Israeli army who are believers who have prayer meetings and stuff, you know, stuff you would never have seen 20 years ago, or never. 
but it's happening now and it's growing and so Satan is attacking and he's not only attacking from without with, with the Yad Lachim and with the rabbis and things like this and the Ministry of Interior he's attacking internally with false teachers and false prophets and false apostles Menno is one of the pastors, not the only one, but one of the pastors who has taken a stand against this stuff. This organization in Israel is known as Tikkun. And they've gone so far, if you can believe it, they're ascribing to themselves the kind of authority the apostles had in Acts 15 at the first church council, saying that the rest of the church the body of Christ should listen to the decisions coming from Jerusalem. But not only that, the theological, I shouldn't revile, but <laughs> they're, theo, they're doctrinally ignorant people. Uh, the main leader in, from America, I uh, don't want to be specific, he had a son that was tragically as, asphyxiated in a fire. And his son was kept breathing, his son's corpse, rather, was kept, oh, after being brain dead, was kept respirating on artificial life support system. And he, he, he was getting prophecies from crazy people claiming to be prophets that God was going to raise his son up. They wouldn't disconnect the respirator and the artificial life support system. They wouldn't bury the corpse. Now, I can understand how any father faced with that kind of devastation would want to cling on to any hope that God was going to do this. But why are you hanging out with such false prophets to begin with who give you a false hope? <laughs> Not that God can't raise people from the dead. He's going to do it. Don't worry. However, these are the kind of people you're talking about. They're, they're arrogant. They believe they have some power and authority. And anyway, Menno is one of the pastors who has risen up to protect the flock in Israel from these people. Ah, which we agree with, we uh, thank the Lord, we applaud. In the process of doing it, he addressed their post-tribulationism, their post-tribulationism, which is completely false highlighting his own pre-tribulationism against the post-tribulationism. His motive was not to push pre-tribulationism. His motive inciting pre-tribulationism was to counter the post-tribulationism, which we are also co-equally against. I can handle pre-trib people. We can agree to disagree. We can discuss. We can constructively debate if there's a right spirit. But post-millennial people, are, it's just daft. What they believe is just completely daft. There's no basis for even dialogue with them if, if they're sold out to such nonsense. Uh, this kind of nonsense has always wrecked havoc in the church. After Constantine pseudo-Christianized the Roman Empire, what happened? The church became a political empire. What came out of it was the Roman papacy, the Dark Ages, they said the millennium was fulfilled in the church. Uh, the kingdom has already come and it's the church, meaning the, the Roman church or the Eastern Orthodox church, something like that. Uh, it's always, always been wrong. It's always wrecked havoc. There are extreme Calvinists who have their own version of it called Reconstructionism. Reconstructionist Calvinists. People like the late Rouses Farstuni, Gary North, Greg Bonson, David Shilton, people like that. There was a Calvinistic version of it. Then there was the Restorationism that was popular in England in the 1980s. But now these views have been effectively embraced by new apostolic Reformation people. We're going to establish the kingdom, then the Lord's going to come after we're the triumphant. Oh, my Lord. In other words, instead of the Lord coming returning to establish his, his, his messianic kingdom in the millennium with the church that's been raptured and resurrected, he's coming for a victorious church. That it doesn't depend on the Lord, it depends on 
us, uh, which is directly contrary to what we read in many passages, such as Romans 16, the Lord of glory will trample Satan under your feet. In, some <laughs> in any event, that is what Mena will be talking about in part tomorrow. But understand, he's not trying to push the pre-trib against what, what I believe. He's trying to refute something that I also am wanting to refute. Only I just think it is much better for an Israeli to address the NAR in Israel and this tikkun stuff and these new fangled self-appointed apostles. It's better for an Israeli pastor to do it than it is for me to do it. So that is just something to be borne in mind tomorrow, okay? There's no uh, dispute between Meno and myself. It's, it's the thing of, of the nature that we would discuss, but we would not contend for in any kind of a divisive way. Um, although, again, I emphasize the issue is important and, and needs to be discussed and confronted. But that was not his purpose in raising it. His purpose in raising it was to oppose what we oppose, the NAR in Israel. That's a big thing that's happening in Israel right now. When the church begins to grow, when the natural branches are grafted in again, Satan's going to attack. Now we know that the return of Christ depends both on God's prophetic purpose for Israel and the Jews and God's prophetic purpose for the true church. Affecting both of those things, however, affecting both his purpose for Israel and the Jews and affecting his purpose for the true church is the natural branches being grafted in again. The increase in the numbers of Jews who will be saved in the last days before Christ returns and after. Remember, once the rapture and resurrection take place, the redemptive purposes of God returns to Israel and the Jews. He's no longer concerned primarily with the nations. He's concerned only with people in the nations relative to Israel. In the book of Revelation, once the faithful church is removed, the prophecies are focused on Israel. The Battle of Armageddon, the, the uh, tribulational temple, things of this nature, the faithful church has been removed. The time of the Gentiles is going to end. The age of the church, as we know it, will have been over. He's now dealing with Israel again. And when you see the natural branches being grafted in again, we know that that is one of the things that points to the return of Jesus. So many Christians, and I know most of you know this, my apologetic regrets to those who do, which probably includes most of you. Many Christians, many believers understand that the rebirth of national Israel is of prophetic significance, and they're correct. They're absolutely correct. But when we read the New Testament and Isaiah carefully, the numbers of Jews returning to faith in Jesus and their Messiah is just as big and just as important a sign of his return as is the rebirth of the nation. Satan, as we speak, is trying to destroy Israel. He's particularly trying to obliterate the Jewish presence in Jerusalem uh, because that's where Christ is going to return. That's where Satan received his biggest defeat and where his final defeat will culminate. He's desperate. There's a spiritual battle in back of these things. We see it in the book of Daniel, chapter 10, in the book of Revelation, the place of Iran in prophecy. We see what's really happening on back of Mr. Trump and Mr. Netanyahu. There are spiritual forces on back of these things. Daniel and Revelation show us this. Okay, there is a battle over the survival of Israel as a nation. Satan wants to destroy it to prevent the return of Christ. The same as Satan raised up Haman at Purim, or the same as Satan used Pharaoh and, and Amalek to try to wipe the Jews out to prevent the first coming of Christ, he's trying to wipe the Jews out to prevent the second coming of Christ. It didn't work the first time, and it's not going to work the second time, but he's going to try. And well, he is trying. That's true. 
there is a spiritual battle over what we see transpiring in the Middle East. It is not purely political or strategic. What we see happening in the strategic and political spheres are simply reflections of what's happening in the spiritual sphere. The BDS movement and the absurdity of, of, of saying Israel's an apartheid state. You know, I refused to speak in South Africa during apartheid. I refused to go to a segregated church. We have a mission that we began from a brother from Manchester, Pastor Dave Royal, he's there now, work with, 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 with black AIDS children in Africa. I'd spent a lot of time in Africa. Morial has a branch in South Africa. Don't tell anybody who has seen apartheid and knows what it is, <laughs> or what it was, that Israel's apartheid. <laughs> It demeans what apartheid was. 22% <laughs> of the university students in Israel, 22% are Arab. <laughs> the Arabs in Israel have the third highest standard of living in the Arab world. The standard of living of the Arabs in Gaza and in the West Bank according to the World Health Organization, it increased 320% in Gaza and about 300% in the West Bank above what it was. The reason it's gone down again is because Islam has come in control of those places, because of Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. When it was the Israelis, unemployment went down, standard of living increased, infant mortality decreased, <laughs> they were better off. It's a simple fact. Yet they're saying Israel's guilty of this terrible thing. <laughs> You've heard me say this. I've been to Saudi Arabia. I, I know what happens to Christians in the surrounding countries. And God bless those brethren in, in Iran. I mean, Yet they single out Israel. The best women's rights record, the best Christian rights records and, and record, and the best human rights record in the Middle East, and they want to single them out as, as the culprit, as the oppressor. It's just a big lie. And you have educated people, professors in universities, liars. Liars of the left-wing media, professional liars who work for the BBC and CNN. Professional liars, professors in universities, professional liars. The Labor Party, Jeremy Corbyn's people, professional liars. The squad in the United States, professional liars. These are professional liars. Calling for boycotts of Israel because it's apartheid. They don't know what apartheid is. Or if they do, they're lying about it. If they do, they're lying about it. Um, is Israel perfect? No. But there's an effort to destroy it, and it's Satan on back of these things. Ultimately, he's going to make a last attempt to destroy the Jews, and Jesus will return and save those who survive. Okay, he will intervene. But in the meantime, he sees Jews being saved. He sees the natural branches being grafted in. My wife's parents were Holocaust survivors. My wife's grandfather was murdered, other members of the family murdered in the Holocaust. And they see their daughter turns to faith in the Jewish Messiah, bearing in mind the Nazis said they were Christians. And the Nazi collaborators in the Romanian Orthodox Church said they were Christians. Okay. Uh, I remember my children when they were very little in Israel asking their grandparents, oh, why don't you believe in our Messiah Yeshua? This is Holocaust survivors. It is absolutely incredible. There's no explanation other than the hand of God. That is the children and grandchildren of the generation of Jews who survived the Holocaust that are turning to Yeshua. 
it makes no logical sense unless God is doing it. You know, that has not happened since the second century on anything like this scale. The rabbis admit that. And it's happening because the Word of God said it would happen. The natural branches are being grafted in, and Satan is trying to attack it. He's tried to attack it through replacement theology and supersessionism. He's always tried that. Thinly veiled expressions of Christian anti-Semitism, even among people claiming to be evangelical. He's always tried to attack it through replacementism, which is a false doctrine. He has tried to attack it through neo-Galatianism, hyper-Messianic extremism. People going back under the law, trying to live under two covenants like the, like the Seventh-day Adventists, only a Messianic version of it, putting Gentiles under the law, you go to the Messianic fellowships, they're not synagogues, they're synagogues. They're putting Gentiles under the law. It's almost absurd what they do. Now, I'm not saying the entire Messianic movement is like that, but a lot of it is. And the lunatic fringe has the upper hand. I would estimate probably two-thirds of the Messianic movement, not of Messianic Jews, but two-thirds of the Messianic movement is doctrinally not doctrinally solid. Um, again, this is the work of Satan trying to upset what God is doing among Jewish believers. Now, we're talking about the church, the body of Christ, the body of Messiah in Israel, past, present, and future. I wish Mena was here to explain this, but I will do my best. There are certain things in Israel we have to understand about the believers there. There are three kinds of believers in Israel. There are the indigenous Israeli Jewish believers. There are the indigenous Arab believers. And there are the expatriates, people from America, Britain, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, other mainly English-speaking countries, but not only, but mainly. And they're philo-Semitic Gentiles. They, they're non-Jews who have a love for Israel and the Jews, and they recognize God's prophetic purpose for Israel. Unfortunately, most of the media, the Christian media, most of what you hear about and from Israel does not come from the indigenous believers. It mostly comes from this humongous expatriate organ. Now, there is no doubt that the number of believing Jews has increased exponentially in the last 25, 30 years. There's no doubt, and it's gaining momentum all the time. There's no doubt this is true. But you hear these exaggerated figures. There's tens of thousands and all this. A lot of these people are expatriates. <laughs> they want to come to Israel because that's where prophecy is happening and be part of the fanfare. Some of these people will live in Israel for many years <clears throat> and never learn the Hebrew language or the Arabic language. <laughs> now, if God has called you to ministry in a foreign country, you're going to acquire the local language and culture. <laughs> These people may as well be in Minnesota or somewhere. It's almost silly, a lot of it. Almost silly. Now, I'm not saying all the expatriates are like that, but a lot of them are. A lot of them are. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. And we are not saying all Messianic Jewish believers are in the Neo-Galatian camp. They're not. But in Israel, you'll find something. Those hyper-Messianic ones trying to go under the law, they exist. But they are very conspicuously in a distinct minority. Most Israeli believers are like other Israelis. 
In Presswich and Manchester, Jewish identity is something you have to build into your children and grandchildren. <coughs> With the Hebrew feasts, Jewish schools, whatever. In Israel, Jewish identity comes naturally because it is the indigenous culture. It comes naturally. Israelis take Jewish identity for granted. The only thing anything like it in the world that even comes close to it is New York City, just because there's so many Jews. But outside of New York City, there's, there's nothing like it. It's, it's a predominant culture taken for granted. They don't feel they have to assert it or exert it or maintain it. There is a small, there are a small number of fellowships who do push this thing, but again, most of those are led by people who came from America, <laughs> or at least they're funded from America, a couple of exceptions. Uh, and again, not all the American influence is bad. Some of it's been, been quite good for Israel, but we're talking about the downside now. So the indigenous body of Christ in Israel, you've got to understand it's different than what most of you hear about. The local believers, it's, it's quite different. They're different. They don't push the Jewish identity thing to the same extent it's pushed in the Messianic fellowships and the diaspora, generally speaking. There are exceptions. Because Jewish identity is taken for granted sociologically in the country. And, and Jewish belie Israeli believers are like any other believers. Don't worry, I know it's not Corona. Quit smoking. <laughs> the second thing you'll find in Israel, though, and this is one of my complaints, I suppose I'd say a complaint. Most Israeli believers and most Israeli congregations, the local Messianic fellowships, Kelot Meshachiot, most of them. If you were to ask them or their leaders, do you believe it's the last days? They would say yes. Do you believe the rebirth of Israel fulfills prophecy? They would say yes. Do you believe the increase in numbers in Jews coming to faith in Yeshua is of prophetic significance? They would say yes. They would in principle agree with all of it. But that's as far as it would go. It's not a major emphasis. <laughs> They would agree with it doctrinally, but it's not something which they are, in any sense, fixated on. This idea of prophecy and the return of Christ, that is more, much more, among these expatriates, you understand? The Israelis are concerned with being good witnesses for Yeshua and a society that is either ambiv that is either ambivalent towards him or hostile to him inimical to him they're concerned with their witness they're concerned with the salvation of the families friends neighbors and things like that there's the evangelistic element and so forth they're concerned with that but they're concerned with how you bring your children up in the society as a jew and as an israeli who believes in yeshua you know what i mean how you can be a believer in the army or in the university. They're concerned with things that are of practical consequence in their day-to-day -day lives as individuals and as families and as congregations. They're much more concerned with that stuff. Most of the teaching, most of the preaching that goes on in their fellowships, it's stuff like that. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's things like that. They are ignoring prophecy as an emphasis. And because of the growth, there is a continual need for milk for the babies. There is not a lot of meat taught in most of the congregations. There's not a lot of the meat. Now I point this out for a reason. When we get to chapters 5 and 6, we're going to see the reason. 
In the early church, where we're going to begin tonight and tomorrow, in the early church in Israel, remember we have several epistles. Well, let's begin with the Gospels. Matthew and John were written to Jews. That is not to say that their content is not for everyone, but it is to say to understand the perspective of the writer, the way the Holy Spirit inspired them to write. You've got to understand that they were writing to Jews at that time to understand what it means for others, Jew and non-Jew, today. Matthew and John were much more Hebraic. Luke also has Hebraic stuff, but he was a Syrophoenician convert to Judaism, and he was a physician, but he was trying to explain things that Jews knew to non-Jews. You understand? When Luke talks about Jewish things, he's, he's explaining things that Matthew and John didn't need to. <laughs> that makes sense. Well, let's go now into the epistles. The epistle of Jude, the epistle of James. First and second Peter, and above all, Hebrews. Those five were written primarily to believing Jews. Once again, the content applies to all of us. But you have to understand what it meant at that time for those people in order to correctly interpret and apply it to believers now was written to Jews. The oldest book, the first book of the New Testament ever written is the Epistle of James. Scholars are generally agreed Mark was the first gospel, but James was the first book. James uses the term synagogue for the church. Synagogue, gathering, not synagogue. It's, it's, it's a word of Greek origin, not Hebrew or Aramaic. Okay. Uh, and he's writing, obviously, to, to believing Jews, to the 12 tribes, okay, that, which were scattered. Now, right there, that tells us certain things. British Israelism, which became popular in this country when Benjamin Disraeli, a Jew, who was a Christian, became prime minister. Crazy inventions began to, he, he wasn't this, but other people did, that the Anglo-Saxon nations and the Celtic nations are the lost tribes. <laughs> uh, British Israelism, in the United States it's called Armstrongism. Uh, they were a father and son on the radio in America who used to argue with each other. I used to call them that there ain't no hell in the hell there ain't. They were they were cultic, the Worldwide Church of God. A lot of them did become believers after Armstrong was dead. A lot of them did get saved. But in the state of Armstrong, here was British Israelism. They operate on the premise that the 12 tribes disappeared. We know from the New Testament and from Jewish history that they did not disappear. In 70 AD, when the temple records were burned, it became difficult and eventually impossible to always determine which tribe. Unless they had a Levitical name or something, it was difficult to know which tribe. But Anna, in the Gospel of Luke, was from the tribe of Asher. Remember? She knew what tribe she was in. Judah and Benjamin were in the south with some of the Levites from the ten northern tribes supposedly disappeared or they intermarried with the Assyrians and became the Samaritans. Yeah, but during the revivals of King Asa, for instance, large numbers of faithful people who didn't bow the knee to Baal came south to Judah. You understand? Like leaving a bad church for a good one. <laughs> People in Israel came to Judah. The faithful people came south, we're told in, in Kings and Chronicles. Okay. They had their identity. 
So James writes to the 12 tribes. They were never lost. Another lunatic fringe group that came from this country were the exclusive brethren who followed John Darby, the primary architect, by the way, of pre-tribulationism. Darby was a hyper-dispensationalist, and he taught the epistle of James was part of the Old Testament. It's not for the church, it's for the Jews, to the 12 tribes. <laughs> Boy, can you imagine? He says that it's not for the church. Now he also said the Sermon on the Mount is not for the church, and that Matthew 24 and the Olivet Discourse is not for the church. It's for unsaved Jews. The New Testament was written for unsaved Jews. Oh, Lord. This is Darbyism. It is this theology upon which pre-tribulationism largely depended in its foundation. So you had these people who were British Israelite, as they call themselves in this country, and you had the Darbyists who were hyper-dispensational. They had a, a hermeneutic that came from ancient Marcionism, but I won't go there now. Okay, there, there were them. Just a crazy idea. Fast forward. Martin Luther was reacting against the errors of medieval Catholicism, where salvation was by sacraments, by works, or at best by synergism. God does something, we have to do something. Luther did not understand the difference between works and works of the law. So Luther said, James is not part of the New Testament canon. Martin Luther rejected the epistle of James as being canonical. He also said basically the same about the book of Revelation because he couldn't understand it. Now, if somebody was to tell you, I don't agree with a certain book of the New Testament, it's not the Word of God today, we'd call him a heretic. <laughs> well, Martin Luther is a man who began right, but ended badly. He went into vehement anti-Semitism, his position in the uh, Peasants' Revolt was rather shocking, but the theologically and doctrinally, he went into considerable error. Not in the beginning, but later on. One of which is, he didn't like Jewish literature in the New Testament, particularly the Epistle of James, because what it said about faith without works is dead. He didn't understand you know, the, the, what, what it meant by works and things like this. Um, he didn't understand what James was meaning by works, even. Uh, and, uh, as you know, Christians don't do works to get saved. They do good works because they've been saved. Okay. But... At that. So, so the Lutherans couldn't handle this. So between replacement theology, hyper-dispensationalism, British Israelism, and Lutheranism, the Judaic origins of New Testament literature were blurred almost censored, filtered out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, that's not how the early Christians would have understood it. We always have to go back to understand the way the people who got their doctrine from the apostles would have understood the scripture before we can correctly interpret what it means for us. James was written to Jewish believers. Jude was written to Jewish believers. Unless you knew the things a Jew in the first century would know, Jude's epistle doesn't make a lot of sense. He's using a certain kind of typology that you'd find in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Qumran and things like this, and he's using deep midrash, not just as an interpretation method or as a hermeneutic, but as a literary form. And almost, and you know, the, the twice dead, the waterless clouds and all this kind of stuff. Well, people without a Jewish background wouldn't have understood what he was talking about. Okay. So now we come to the church in Israel. 
what was, what is, what's going to be. The way it was in the first century, the way it became, and the way it's going to be. Body of Christ in Israel, past, present, and future. Hebrews, Romans, James, and Peter all have aspects of what was the situation of believing Jews in the first century. All of them. But Hebrews is focused on believing Jews in Israel and specifically in Jerusalem. Okay? It's focused on the body of Christ, the body of Messiah in geographical Israel. Hebrews is written to Jews in Israel. So let's look at the beginning. Is everybody with me so far, what I've said? Let's begin understanding this. It is written during a time of increasing persecution. The persecution was both of the church by pagans. An international or a global persecution that would come in the second and third century did not happen yet, but there were local persecutions that were brutal, particularly in certain places, one of which was Rome. This was before the Colosseum was built. Nero killed Peter and Paul, okay? These were traumatic events to the early church. They expected Jesus to come in their lifetime. They allowed for the fact he might not, but the general expectation was it was imminent. Okay? Imminent. This was a problem in the early church, and it is a problem now, the doctrine of imminency. There are people who go so far, such as Thomas Ice in America, and he wrote one or two pretty good books on other subjects, by the way. I'm not saying he's complete rubbish by any means. He and a guy named Wayne House, as much as I disagree with them on eschatology and things like this, their refutation of, of, of dominion theology was sterling. <laughs> they, they did a great job. And, and exposing the errors of people like Rick Godwin in America and things like this, they did, they did some good work. Uh, Wayne House also expo exposed Gail Ripplinger as a fraud. You know, the King James only woman who couldn't even, the, whose degree was in home economics and couldn't even read Greek herself. <laughs> about the Bible versions, conspiracy thing. I mean, they, they did some good work. But they have this idea of imminency to the point where they would say, well, there may be some pro prophetic meaning to Israel, but it doesn't fulfill prophecy. There are no signs of his return. He can return at any moment. We shouldn't be looking for signs of his return. That's how far they take imminency. They wouldn't deny that Israel is reborn as a nation according to God's plan, but they would say it is not really a prophecy about the return of Christ. There are no prophecies about the return. It can happen any moment. These are extreme proponents of imminency. People who believe in this version of imminency equate it with something called the blessed hope, the blessed hope. They take what the epistles mean by the blessed hope and give it a completely different definition. They say the blessed hope means the rapture. To them, the blessed hope is the rapture. If you don't believe in an imminent rapture, you don't believe in the blessed hope. Well, there are two problems with this. First of all, when Paul wrote about the blessed hope, did he have it? Yes. Was he raptured? 
No. His blessed hope turned to hopelessness. <laughs> it is non sequitur. It, 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 it's reductio ad absurdum. It's, it's, it's a fool. It doesn't work. The other problem is Paul speaks about those who have fallen asleep in Christ in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And it says, don't grieve for them as those who have no hope. Those who are asleep in the Lord, believers who have given up the ghost, have the same hope as the ones who are raptured. The dead in Christ rise first, we meet him in the air. Every believer, whether they give up the ghost or they're here when the Lord returns, has the blessed hope. Every believer has the blessed hope. They redefine the blessed hope as the rapture, which is nonsense. But they also have a different doctrine of imminency. Now, on a newer teaching, we have clearing up the confusion on the Moria website. We look at some of these issues. You've heard Calvinistic people talk about, from their tulip, they would talk about perseverance of the saints, wouldn't they? By which they mean an unconditional one saved, always saved. That's what they believe. It doesn't actually come from Calvin directly. It comes from the remonstrance of Dort in Holland. Now that term occurs twice in Scripture. One place is in Revelation 13. When the Antichrist comes and persecutes the church, we read in verse 9, here is the perseverance and faith of the saints. In Revelation chapter 14, those who refuse the mark of the beast, here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Those are the only two places the term occurs in Scripture. In both places, it is a prophetic truth of believers in the last days who will resist the Antichrist. Both places, in exegetical context, it's talking about that. Do I believe in perseverance of the saints? Absolutely! as Scripture defines it, not as Calvinists redefine it. <laughs> they have no biblical basis for what they do, none. It's not what the term means in context. None. Anybody can see it. It's not what it means. Yes, it's a prophecy about those believers who will be here at that time. Of course I believe it. It's going to happen. Absolutely, I believe it. But it doesn't mean what they think. It has nothing to do with unconditional once saved, always saved. They've given perseverance a completely different definition of their own ridiculous invention. Well, imminence is the same. They give it a completely different definition of their own. That doesn't really make sense. The real doctrine of imminence or imminency is this. Remember the parable of the wealthy farmer with the two barns Jesus gave. And Jesus said, You foolish man, you're accumulating wealth and hoping in this life. Tonight your soul is required of you. Do I believe the Lord can come at any second? Yes. He can come at any second for me. He can come at any second for you. He can come at any instant, and we should live our lives accordingly. Nobody knows how long we've got. Nobody, even a young, healthy person. I remember reading about this fitness freak who dropped dead jogging in Central Park. <laughs> they were young, fit, they, they, and they dropped dead jogging, and some and they young, fit, they're training for a marathon or something, they dropped dead. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. 
Yes, the Lord can come at any second, any instant for any of us. But that's not the same as saying the rapture can happen at any time. The rapture will not happen until the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. With all due respect to my friends who differ. Be that as it may, you understand the problem. The doctrine of immanism is something different. Okay. Well, the early church was like this. This was one of the main problems that confronted the early believers, but especially the early Jewish believers. They believed the return of Christ was imminent. They believed it was likely to happen in their biological lifetime. One of the reasons the book of Revelation was written by John at the end of the first century, the last living apostle to survive, was because all the other apostles were dead and the Lord had not returned yet. Where is he? <laughs> People were becoming despondent and beginning to doubt and needed to be reassured. So in the early church, there was a misunderstanding by the Jewish believers of the doctrine of imminency, an imminent return of Christ. Okay? Now, that was one problem. At first, they believed the parousia was impending. They believed the parousia was impending. I once had a Pentecostal evangelist in England tell me a number of years ago, not that many years ago, but a number of years ago, that he wasn't concerned about the way his particular denomination or movement was gravitating away from Scripture. He didn't like what was happening in the Elam movement. He didn't agree with it. He knew it was wrong, but he said it didn't trouble him because the Lord is coming back so soon it won't matter. <laughs> and this was a godly and sincere man who's, who had a very honest desire to see people saved and who longed for the return of Jesus. There's no question about his personal faith and sincerity and things like that. The man loved the Lord. But his theology was messed up. He was believing the same kind of thing. This was a big problem in the early church, you understand. And it's become a problem in Israel today. There are people from the expatriate community, particularly, who are always on about prophecy, 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 to the negation of almost everything else. These people are hyper-prone to things like conspiracy theories, hyper-prone to it. And as always, have you got the latest inside scoop about what's going on and all this kind of stuff? And oh my, God. have you heard that the Netanyahu's a believer? And all? They're always on about all this stuff, you know. And it's always speculation, and, and and somehow they relate this speculation, and even these conspiracy theories, they confuse it with prophecy. Okay. In reaction to that there were those who began to ignore it. There were those in the early church who became 
temporal in focus. They began to ignore the prophetic. They wouldn't have denied the Lord was coming, but it was not a major emphasis in their thinking or in their doctrinal awareness. They would have agreed with it, but you had a situation like you do now. I'm sorry. I've got a Jewish nose, the rest of me is Irish. The people who were always on about crazy prophecies so discredit the reality of the coming of Christ that other Christians disassociate from it. Uh, let me give you some examples. There was a kook who had hundreds of thousands of views on the internet less than three years ago, two and a half years ago. And he said, because according to the zodiac, <laughs> I'm not joking, the moon is in Virgo, that the prophecy of Revelation 12 with the woman with the stars and the moon took place or was going to take place on the 23rd of September in 2017. There were Christians obsessed with this. They were sending newsletters and they were all this stuff and going about, and they were blogging about it, and they believed it. They actually believed it. We saw similar things with the Y2K scares. This was going to be the beginning of the Great Tribulation and all this stuff. It becomes the boy who cried wolf syndrome. When this stuff does not pan out as they were completely convinced it would, <laughs> other people think, I don't want to be associated with looking at prophecy. There are other issues we have to be more concerned with. So you've got those who are hyper-concerned with it and those who are ignoring it. And of course, I don't want to go into it now, it's not our purpose, but people like Rick Warren, false teachers who say to avoid it. Neither one of these extremes is balanced. You understand? Neither one is balanced. But it is not a new problem. It's not a new problem. Now, this persecution that the believers in Israel faced was one, a growing Roman opposition, both to the Jews and to the church. They knew about the imperial persecution of the apostles in Rome and in other places. Okay. And they knew there was a growing Jewish nationalism inside of Israel at the time Hebrews was written. They began to forget what Jesus and Daniel warned was going to happen and eventually happened in 70 AD. You understand? So while the stage was being set for prophetically significant events predicted directly by Jesus and Daniel, that foreshadow, that prefigure the return of Christ, th those events are types. You've heard me say this. What happened in 70 AD 
It will be recapitulated. It's a type of what's going to happen at the close of the age. Okay. When the stage was being set for this stuff, they began to lose sight of what was coming. So, they were ignoring it. They began ignoring prophecy and they became temporal in focus. In English, the word ignore and the word ignorant are related, aren't they? This became an issue. When we read Hebrews, we have to understand the climate it was addressing. They needed to be remembered that the temple was going to be destroyed. In this climate of persecution, something happened. The believers were being persecuted by the Sanhedrin. At the same time, imperial persecution by the Roman authorities was growing in the Roman Empire. They found themselves in an environment where they and their families and their congregation was under threat. They were being persecuted. The persecution did not reach the intensity it later would. Ultimately, the Apostle James was martyred. just before the Roman siege by Titus commenced. <laughs> okay, you can read this in Josephus and things like that in Eusebius. Okay. Um, so in this time of persecution, they were looking to avoid the persecution. Again, as Israelis, for want of a better term, they didn't like the Romans. On the other hand, the Sanhedrin didn't like them. They somehow began to imagine that by going back under the law, they could pacify the religious opposition. Some of them abandoned faith in Yeshua and went back into temple Levitical worship. Some of them. Others gravitated towards Galatianism, trying to live under two covenants to placate the religious. This has certainly happened today in the diaspora and to a more limited degree in Israel. The Yad Lachim and the Orthodox Rabbinuts are not going to be more accepting of Jewish believers because they put on tefillin or wear yarmulkes. Now, if somebody is trying to be culturally identified with the Jews, they're trying to reach and say, look, I'm a Jew, and I eat kosher, I do everything you do as a Jew, but I believe Jesus is the Messiah. That's one thing. But you're not going to stop the religious establishment from hating you. They don't believe the Torah. If you believe Moses, you'd believe me also. If they don't believe the Torah, they're not going to believe Yeshua. Remember, Orthodox Jews, their real problem is not that they reject Yeshua. That is the consequence. That is the tragic ramification of the problem. But it's not the problem. The problem is they don't believe Moses and the prophets. <laughs>
if they really believed Moses, if they really believed the Torah, Yeshua, Jesus said, in John 5, they'd know he was the Messiah. Paul says the law is our pedion, our tutor, to point us to the Messiah. If they really believed what they claimed to believe, they'd know he's the Messiah. Talk to a Jew who was saved out of Orthodox Judaism. We have a, more, we don't use the term missionary, but somebody with Moriel in Israel, with our team there, was from a Hasidic family in Presswich. She grew up Yiddish-speaking in Presswich and a Hasidic family, ultra-Orthodox. They actually had a funeral for her when she got saved. Some of you know her. I don't want to say it on film who it is, obviously, but, you know. And uh, it, it, I just mentioned her because she's from up here. She's from Manchester. Talk to her. She'll tell you. They don't have a clue. They, they, they don't care what Moses said. They care what the rabbis said. <laughs> They're replacing the word of God with the word of man. They're never going to accept. You are not going to ingratiate yourself with Orthodox rabbis or the Chabad or the Yad Lachim by Jewish observance. That is not going to stop persecution or opposition to believing Jews, certainly not in Israel. Jewish believer makes Aliyah as a Jew. <laughs> They've got to keep totally quiet about their faith until they, once they've been in the army or something like that, they can't get rid of them. But initially, the Ministry of Interior, controlled by the religious, to block the Aliyah. There's been Jewish believers who fought nearly 10 years in court. 10 years. And there's some still fighting. You're never going to stop these people from disliking you. Well, again, this problem has ancient origins. The only thing you can do is come out and renounce your faith in Yeshua. Then they'll like you. Then they'll accept you. Then everything will be all right with them. Won't be all right with Hashem with God, but it'll be all right with them. So you had this reaction to persecution in the early church. This was a big issue. Much of the epistle to the Hebrews is concerned with this, okay? Now, another issue was false Christology. In the early church, there were people who had origins in the first century, but then they became more prominent in the second and third century. They were Jews who said, Jesus is the Messiah, but he's not God. They deny his deity, accepting his Messiahship, but denying his deity. Now, scripturally, theologically, if you reject his deity, you reject his messiahship. <laughs> because the messiah is God. He became a man. Hebrews deals with this issue. Okay. It speaks of Yeshua in Hebrews chapter 1 as... The radiance of the glory of God. In other words, Jesus is the rays of the sun. The sun is analogous to God. He is the radiance of the Father's glory. Yeah. But it goes on and says some other stuff. The radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. If you reject the deity of the Messiah, you've rejected the true Messiah. 
There are in Israel today, and it's more of a problem in Israel than it is in the diaspora, ironically. The same as you've got things that are more problematic in the diaspora than they are in Israel, there are things in Israel that are more problematic than in the diaspora. Ebionites, Ebionites, today we have Neo-Ebionites, you might call them, they believe Yeshua is the Messiah, but they don't believe he was God. You'll hear people speaking of secret believers even among the Orthodox, even among the Hasidim, they're secret believers in Meir Sharim. Well, there are. I have met them. I've seen them. They exist, but not in large numbers. <laughs> the numbers are inflated, but they do exist. However, the scriptures say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you don't confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father and his angels. And when you talk to these people, you find out that they're Ebionites most of the time, at least from my experience. They will concede Jesus is the Messiah, but they will flatly reject his deity. There was a Jewish American guy I know He'd been a friend of mine. He came and made Aliyah to Israel. I was at his wedding. He wound up leaving his wife and kids. Uh, well, I can say his name, Uri Marcus. He went into Ebionism. He denied the Messiahship of Yeshua. He denied, and this was a major issue in destroying his family and his marriage. He, he denied the Messiahship of Yeshua as God. Quite happy for him to be the Messiah, but not as God. Okay? Not as God. Well, I'm sad to say that there are those, even certain leaders in Israel, who, although they personally believe in the deity of Christ, they believe Yeshua is God, they have stated that we should not divide from the brethren who don't. As a young believer, my wife and I sometimes attended this fellowship in Jerusalem. Uh, it wasn't the only one or the main one, but we'd go to it. And there was an Ebionite in there. Now, he had a brother who was completely orthodox. Not orthodox Jew, but orthodox in his beliefs about Jesus. Completely scripturated. The brother was complete. He was very observant, but he believed what we believe about Yeshua. But the other brother did not. He was an Ebionite. And he got to my wife, at that time my girlfriend, and putting all kinds of stuff in her head. It got straightened out, of course. But they were allowing this guy to be a communicant. They were allowing this guy to take the Lord's Supper. They accepted him as a member of the fellowship and as a community to take the Lord's Supper. This was a problem in the early church. And it is a problem now. The first issue Hebrews deals with is the deity of the Messiah. The radiance of the Father's glory, the full nature of God is in him. This relates to what the scriptures teach about the one the rabbis call the Metatron, about the Logos, the Mamre, 
the Devar Adonai, things like this. But it's the first thing the epistle to the Hebrews. He is the Messiah. He is God. But the Zebunite thing wrecked havoc in the early church in Israel. And it has wrecked a fair amount of havoc today. I know people who have been hurt by it. My wife, again at that time my girlfriend, being one of them. Uh, didn't get too far, but that was in our case. Who knows who else they got to or whatever, you know. It's a problem. And there are even small fellowships that are Ebionite. The Ebionites existed up until the 6th century. Up to the 6th century there were still Ebionites. It got to the point where it seemed like, well it got to the point where believing Jews either assimilated, which was not scriptural, they either assimilated and abandoned their Jewish identity contrary to 1 Corinthians 7, or if they didn't abandon their Jewish identity, they were Ebionites. What a choice. Either you so acculturate into a Gentile church that you acculturate into a Gentile culture and deny your own ethnicity and your own culture, which 1 Corinthians 7 says don't do, or you deny the deity of Christ. Those are the choices. What a mess. What a mess. Which wrong, which wrong thing do you want? <laughs> you can choose a lesser of evils, but a lesser of evils is an evil no less. <laughs> what a mess. Total mess. But it happened in the early church. It happened in the early church in Israel. And it is happening in the early church today. Everyone understand. Let's go a little bit further. We'll be coming back looking at other things tomorrow. Again, I've said this till I was blue in the face. Chapter 6, verse 1 of Hebrews. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Messiah, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith towards God, instruction about washing, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. This we will do also if God permits. We're not against that stuff. The Lord may lead us to talk about it sometimes. When you have newly saved people, you need to talk about those things. However, there's no chapter divisions in the Greek canon or the Hebrew. What precedes it? His complaint. Verse 12, by this time you ought to be teachers. But you have need for someone to teach you the elementary principles. You need milk, not solid food. Again, we've said these things many, many times. Solid food is for the mature. Those who have the practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. And the solid food is the meat. But the meat is in verse 10. Melchizedek, for instance, as a Christophany, an Old Testament appearance of Christ. That's meat. Yeshua loves me this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's milk. He's complaining. You want to be teachers by now. I want to tell you about Melchizedek and Yeshua in the Old Testament. But I've got to teach you baby food. Well, again, milk would be a big improvement compared to some of what's being served today. Reminds me of the Hindus I've seen in India with the cow urine. 
Not to be disgusting, but it really happens. I think it's holy. Anyway, again, you've all heard me say this. The baby crawling on the floor will put anything in its mouth. Its mother has to put everything where it can't reach it because th that baby thinks everything is candy or a biscuit or something like that. It's sweet. Because its senses are not yet mature enough to discern the edible from the inedible. So they eat anything. They've only had milk, not meat. Believers who only know basic doctrine are going to be sitting ducks for false doctrine. They are not going to have discernment. If all they're taught is the basics of salvation and baptism and repentance and the resurrection, true things, good things, necessary things, but if they don't go beyond that, they're going to be prey for deception. Now that's true of all believers of all cultures. But we have to understand the origin of it, the ontogeny of it, were the first Jewish believers in Israel in the first century. They got into the milk, not the meat. The author to Hebrews, we don't know who it was, but it was obviously someone who was familiar with Paul, who knew Timothy, said Timothy's name in, ch in chapter 13. He would have known people like Apollos and so forth, and Peter. But whoever he was, he was complaining. You want to be teachers, and all you know is milk. You, you, Milk's for babies. Again, you have a calcium. <laughs> All you have is calcium. Calcium is good for building up the bones, but there's no protein. <laughs> what happens when, when, when babies only have milk in the third world or places? Does have, one, of, one of the things that happens is a disease called rickets, right? Rickets is <laughs> where they only have, have a lactose diet. The, 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 secondly, it affects the immune system. That you get, oh, you get an immune. Dev, I'm, I'm talking here in front of my friend, the physician. Correct me if I got it wrong, but there's an immunodeficit from malnutrition. Pediatric malnutrition can result in immunodeficit. Immunodeficit. Um, am I correct? Okay. <laughs> Good to know. My entire education is not completely forgotten. <laughs> All the science I learned as a kid's either outdated or forgotten. <clears throat> Be that as it may, well, what's going to happen? <laughs> They'll lead anything. They'll believe every wind of doctrine. They'll believe everything. This was a problem among the early Jewish Christians. They had all this heritage, the Old Testament, but they didn't study it. They didn't know it. Again, it's like churches today, as we've said on our re recent teaching tape of clearing up the confusion. You have a situation where the Old Testament is either used liturgically, people will read the Psalms liturgically, or they are Sunday school stories or bedtime stories for little kids about Jonah and the whale and David and Goliath. There's nothing wrong with Sunday school lessons and bedtime stories for little kids of Jonah and the whale and David and Goliath. It's the appropriate thing for them. But that's the milk. What does that stuff really mean? And how was it fulfilled in Christ? <laughs> that's something else. Jonah's a type of Christ, three days and three nights, all the whole thing. And David, the shadow of Christ, is king and all that's the meat. That is the meat. And so, <laughs> the believers in Israel at the beginning of the church were 
theologically malnourished. Due to an almost exclusively berry-based diet. <laughs> now, when you have a kosher certificate for kashrut in a restaurant, there's two kinds of kosher certificates. You're either certified for dairy or you're certified for meat. <laughs> you understand, the rabbis know there's a difference between milk and meat. They just don't understand what it means because they're not saved. But they know there's a difference between milk and even the rabbis know there's a difference between milk and meat. In Jewish thought, there's a difference between the milk and the meat. Believers are to know the dif what the difference is. The rabbis know there is a difference, but they don't understand what the difference really is. You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk, and they get into all this nonsense, you know, about, you know, suppose you had one plate and you had a dairy dish on it, you know, you made an omelet with some cream and that milk just happened to, to, to be left on the plate, a little drip of it, and therefore, and you ate uh, the, 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 the mother's carcass or something and you mixed the milk and the meat and, and it, it happened to be the milk from her own calf. Or so. This is what they say? So they have separate dishes and all of this stuff. In the Israeli army, you've got different colored dishes for dairy and me, it's just, and the restaurants, you'll see what kind of kashrut certificate it has. <laughs> Again, what you see now, it's there, but the rabbis don't understand what it means because they're not saved. Hebrews explains what this stuff means. You understand? The Epistles of the Hebrews explains Levitical typology, it explains much of the Torah. We can and should think of Hebrews as inspired commentary. It explains how Yeshua fulfills the Levitical sacrificial system and certain other aspects of the Torah. So Hebrews explains the Torah. These were Jews wanting to know what the Torah meant for them or else they just ignored it. We're not under the law. <laughs> Neither is true. The law is our tutor. You won't understand the New Testament in depth unless you understand the Old. But that does not mean going in bondage to the law. Quite a problem. It was a problem in the first century, and it's a problem now. They are malnourished due to an exclusively dairy diet. Okay? In Israel, there's some decent expositors. There's some decent expositors. But most of the teaching is milky. Now, that can in part be justified due to growth. That can in part be justified because you can't give babies meat. They will choke. You need to give babies milk. And if the congregations are growing and there's more unsaved people coming in getting saved, you've got to give them basic diet. That is true. But when you continue to give somebody, you've been saved five years, ten years, this, you know, they're going to fall for something. They will fall for some deception at some point. Right now, it's the new apostolic reformation. I remember when the Berger brothers teamed up with the Sakharam and tried to bring in the Toronto and all this. They'll always get in. And Satan is, of course, targeting Israel. So... These were main problems in the first century Jewish church. These were main problems. But it is conspicuous that they are the main problems again. Now Menno is going to talk about another one more than I will about the false apostles, the NAR and how it's getting into Israel. I'd rather leave that to him. Uh, through the media means we have available, I'm not going to talk about it too much until you hear him, then I'll talk about it a bit, but I want it to come from him mostly. Okay, does everybody got this? Everybody understands this? This is past. <laughs>
This is also present. This is what went down then. This is what's going on now.